from the closet as well. So I just want to give you a brief intro of who Quinn Wiki is. Um, we are Hawaii Senior Resource. Uh, we were started about five years ago. Uh, and we, my colleague and I, Brandon, uh, I'm, I'm Andrew, uh, we're actually realtors. And um, we, we help a lot of clients that uh, were looking to transition, a lot of seniors, uh, in fact. And so we built up a network of these service professionals um, that we would refer them to. And uh, we thought, well, why not open it up to the public and not just, you know, not just for our clients. And so that's how when we got started. So we focus in, in five areas, estate planning, health, real estate, uh, finance, and, uh, estate planning, and um, real estate is what we touch on. Touch on. So um, what we do is we like to put faces to the names. And if you go on our website, you'll, you'll get to see all of our service providers. Um, but what we do is when we have these classes, it's easy to put a face to the name. And so... Um, and Tucker, so we're a law firm, and we're based here in Honolulu, although we service clients on other islands as well. And we give seminars every month. So we vary our topics from month to month. We change our locations. But I like these seminars as well because it's a nice opportunity to reach out to others who I haven't seen before, I haven't spoken to before. And today's topic is um, geared towards people who already have a revocable living trust. But if you don't have one, I don't want you to worry because I start with an overview of estate planning, what is a will versus what is a trust, and why should you have it, and when would you have it. Um, so <clears throat> I just want to give you some background about our law firm briefly before I get into the specifics of today's presentation. So I'm an attorney. I've been practicing law since 2005. And prior to joining Sterling and Tucker, I was a family law attorney, um, specifically a divorce attorney. So as you can imagine, this is a nicer area to be working in. I don't have to fight with anyone. And I even don't have to go to court anymore. So that's really nice. And I um, service a lot of clients here in Honolulu. I also service clients in Hilo. So most weeks I am in Hilo for at least one day um, because we have clients there. And there's another attorney in our office who goes to Maui on a weekly basis so that we can try to reach out to everyone. Now I want to just tell you briefly about our law firm. It actually is a woman-founded law firm. So Judith Sterling and Michelle Tucker are the two founders of the law firm. And Judy, as we call her, is now retired. So both Judy and Michelle met as classmates at the University of Hawaii Law School. And both of them, prior to going to law school, were already CPAs. So they had a tax background. Very bright, intelligent women. Um, Judy retired sooner than she would have liked. And that's because she suffered a series of strokes unexpectedly, um, roughly 10 years ago. And she held on to work for a while, tried to do what she could. But as you know, sometimes um, it's a sign to slow down. And that's what she took it as. And so she is now fully retired. Of course, this business is still very important to her, so we see her pretty often. She comes in and checks on us and checks in on the clients, but now she's enjoying life and traveling. Michelle Tucker is our other founder. So I mentioned her background as a CPA and also as an attorney, but I did not mention that she's a certified financial planner. So since 2006, she's been operating 3D Wealth Management, which is another um, business entity. And we're all housed in the same office. We also have a CPA firm as well, Sterling and Tucker Inc. And they handle tax preparation. They also will weigh in and assist in the event of our estate planning clients' deaths if there are tax returns that need to be uh, prepared. We have a few other attorneys in addition to the three of us. So I just want to direct you to our online presence. We can be found all over the internet. You can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn. We're also on sterlingandtucker.com. We have hawaiielderlaw.com. And we have a YouTube channel that features videos of our attorneys talking about various estate planning topics. So we invite you to check that out. Now, there are two major obstacles to setting up an estate plan or reviewing an estate plan, and we understand them. Number one obstacle, procrastination. We know it's important. We plan to get around to it when we retire, when we reach a certain age. Sometimes we run out of time. Or we're still here, but we're no longer competent. So it's good that you folks are here to get information while you're still alive and well. 
And the other obstacle is a lack of knowledge. Now, you may actually know quite a lot about estate planning, and I find that people do when I speak to them. But if you read a lot, you talk to your friends and neighbors, you see that there's a lot of conflicting information out there. So hopefully, we'll clarify some of those conflicts for you today. Now, this is the agenda for today. I'm going to talk about basic living trust issues. We'll also talk about laws that impact trust, the top 10 reasons why most living trusts fail, and then I will stick around if you folks have any questions at the end. So we want to talk about estate planning. So we'll start from the top. What is an estate? So your estate is everything you own. It's your house, it's your cars, it's your cash in the bank. It's also your retirement plans. Maybe you've got 401ks, annuities, pensions. They are a part of the estate. And insurance. Maybe you've got life insurance policies you've purchased or policies that have been purchased for you. They are also a part of your estate. And then we know those other things that you've got, family heirlooms, jewelry, electronics, whether or not they have a lot of monetary value, they may have a lot of sentimental value, so we still figure them into our assets. Now, for those of you who have a trust, and um, just so I have an idea, how many of you already have a revocable living trust? Okay, great. So I would say about half of you in this room do. So for those of you who have a trust, I want to assure you it was a good idea to set up. Number one reason why you're able to control whom you want to receive your assets upon your deaths. Because you may have relatives and close friends who you have in mind, and you know that those are the people you want to leave things to. But if you didn't write it down, it wouldn't be so clear. And potentially your estate would go through a probate, which is a court proceeding. So having a trust eliminates that problem. Now you also are able to control when you want your assets to pass to beneficiaries. And that's because you may have very young children or grandchildren and you want to provide for them, but you know that you can't really leave a five-year-old a bunch of money without restriction. We want to put special parameters around that sort of inheritance. About 10% of families have a special needs or disabled family member, and we want to do special planning for them as well. Because if they are on government benefits, we don't want to compromise those benefits by giving them a chunk of money. They're then disqualified, and they have to reapply after they've spent down their funds. And then in some families, in many families, we have that person we love and care about as much as everyone else, but they don't always make the best decisions. So we want to protect their share from their bad judgment, perhaps, and have a little more control over how they receive their funds. Now, it was also a good idea to set up this trust because you're able to choose the person who's going to handle the administration of your estate at your death. A lot of people figure, I set up a trust, I set up a will, it, it's done. But that's not quite the case because when you pass away, someone has to be here to survive you and carry out the provisions of your trust. So preferably somebody younger is going to be around and um, be able to do the paperwork and stay out of court, but still just handle whatever needs to be handled in your estate. You also want to avoid costs because none of us want to pay more than we have to for anything. And if you have set up a proper estate plan, you'll see that you don't end up in court you avoid probate court, and you save a lot of money because this pie chart you see should actually all be green if you have a proper estate plan. And that's because you will avoid having to hire attorneys, pay court fees, and you will not lose money in taxes due to poor planning or lack of planning. Now, when we talk about expenses and costs, specifically what usually comes up are what we call a living probate, death probate, and death taxes. And those are things we don't want to spend a lot of money on. Now, a living probate is like a guardianship. If we're disabled, no longer competent, and we don't have any documents to say who can handle things for us, we may find ourselves in that situation. So we can avoid that if we have our documents in order while we're alive and well. And then a death probate is a traditional probate, as most people would think of it. When they pass away, if they do not have any estate plan in place and they own over $100,000 in assets, they own real estate, they will have to go through the court process. Now, death taxes, I'll touch upon today so you folks understand that a bit more. Now, I'll talk about today the fact that there are a lot of living trust plans that are not well done. They're either poorly drafted, they're improperly maintained, meaning we never look at it again and it was set up 30 years ago. 
Maybe they just have bare bones features. You went and saw somebody who prepared a one size fits all document that's not really crafted to your situation. So we'll talk about what features a good estate plan should have and um, we'll answer your questions that you may have. So what we like to do when we talk about estate planning is illustrate everything using a case study. It's a bit easier to follow and hopefully more interesting. So meet our family here. This is the Jones family and Bill and Mary are the parents and they have two children. So John is their oldest child and Susan here closest to me is their younger child. Now John and Susan, I mean excuse me, Bill and um, Mary have set up a trust for their kids. They felt that that was the best thing to do. They had retired, they knew they didn't have a will or anything, and they wanted to make sure upon their deaths everything would go to their kids. So the first step that they took was they transferred assets into their trust. This is a very important step you should not overlook. Um, primarily, your real estate. Many people assume that their property automatically will get pulled into their trust and that's not the case. You have to have a new deed prepared to transfer ownership from yourself or you and your spouse to your trust and that gets recorded and you're still in charge of everything. So it doesn't prevent you from selling or refinancing or transferring the property but it will avoid probate upon your death. Now there are three titles or roles when it comes to a trust. There are the trustors, trustees, and beneficiaries. At our law firm, we use the term trustors. You may have documents that use the word settlor or grantor. They're all the same in that they refer to the owner and creator of the trust. The trustees are the managers and the beneficiaries, of course, get to use the assets. So if you have a trust, you know that it's really business as usual. It's not so different from before. You know, there's no um, restriction on amending the trust. You can make whatever changes you need to. You also will see that there's no change in your property taxes. So if you have a homeowner's exemption on your primary residence and you transfer that property to your trust, you will keep your homeowner's exemption. That's an important feature. Um, there's no new income tax forms to do. So you establish the trust, but you still do your same income tax filing. Nothing new to be done. And so it's really um, business as usual. And you may be thinking, well, why would I set up a trust if it's not so different from before? Well, it is an important standby device. It's going to kick in in the event of your disability, definitely in the event of your death to avoid probate. And by setting up the living trust, you're able to avoid all of these things. So you may have court fees that you would have to pay if you went through a probate, um, publication to creditors in the newspaper. I'm sure you've seen those fine print notices. Um, you also would have to pay an executor who's going to be appointed by the court to manage your estate. And the attorney's fees could also be exorbitant. Um, depending on the nature of the case and how long it goes on. And if you have property in other states, you may have to deal with multiple probates, so probates in those respective states. And you know that can take a long time as well. On average, about one to two years to complete a death probate, but it can be much longer than that, especially if there are complications, conflicts among the beneficiaries, um, et cetera. Now I want to talk about death taxes and um, one thing I want to point out is this death tax is also known as the estate tax exemption. So the estate tax exemption is something that each of us has. When we die, we're going to be taxed if our assets exceed this threshold. So you can see it's changed drastically over the years. Now in the mid 90s, early 2000s, the estate tax exemption was actually only about 600000 to 650000 per person. So a lot of people who owned property in Hawaii assumed that they would be over that estate tax exemption. And so the planning they set up was to account for that lower tax threshold. But now that's changed. Now we're in 2019 and your eyes do not deceive you. It's actually 11.4 million per person. And I think for most of us, probably not too much of a concern. We're not really worried that we're gonna have a taxable estate. However, this number could change, and in fact it will change in the year 2025. And that's because 
the reason it came about as this high exemption was at the end of 2017, there was the Republican tax plan that passed. And so what was projected for 2018 was a $5.6 million exemption. But instead, the tax plan doubled the exemption. So last year it was 11.2 million, it's now 11.4 million, and it's set to sunset or end in the year 2025. And it's going to revert back to about 5 million adjusted annually at the rate of inflation. Still a high threshold for most of us, but something to keep in mind. And that's because Congress back in 2011 almost said that would make it permanent. And we knew it was permanent until they changed their minds again, which they did not that much later. So that's where we are right now. And so this is not much of a concern for most of us, but something to keep in mind. Because if your estate is over this threshold, you will be taxed at a rate of 40%, whatever is over the threshold. So we want to keep that in mind. Now um, that I've done the overview of the trust and estate planning, I'm going to move into the meat of the presentation, which is the top 10 defects that we often see in revocable living trusts. And so um, I'm going to just read through these, but I'll break them down one by one. So we have improper funding. We also have no protection for nursing home costs, no protection for untrustworthy heirs. Sometimes we have um, beneficiaries who have creditor issues or divorce concerns. We also know that there may not be asset protection for disabled or special needs heirs. No ability to create incentives for those who need it. No ability to stretch IRA distributions. Vague or missing trust provisions and no built-in flexibility to adjust to changing circumstances. So I'm going to start with number one, and I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on this one. I touched upon it earlier, but improper funding is a big thing that we see when we review trusts for people who come to see us. And that's because for some people, the whole process is overwhelming. And they think that they'll get around to doing what was recommended by the attorney when they set up their trust, but they fail to do it. And the big thing we see is they haven't put anything in their trust. So you do want to make sure all of your real estate goes into your trust. We want to make sure that your bank accounts, investments, your stocks, your mutual funds, um, brokerage accounts are all titled in your trust because whatever is in the trust will go to the beneficiaries of that trust and will avoid a probate at your death. So big important step. Now defect number two is no nursing home protection. And this is a concern of course for a lot of people. They know that nursing homes are quite expensive um, in Hawaii and right now um, this is rapidly shifting. So about 60% of the population is not in need of long-term care, but 40% is, and this is our aging population. Um, but you know, we're seeing the numbers skew in the other direction. And this is a figure, um, a pretty current figure from 2017. I know the 2018 number just changed slightly, so I just left this number here. And what this is, is the cost of a single occupancy um, nursing home room um, for an individual per year. So this is somebody who has a requirement of a skilled nursing care um, level. So in other words, it's not an assisted living facility, it's another um, full care facility. And it's quite expensive. When you do the math yourself, you know this is roughly about $13,000 a month. And if you just think of the nature of your assets, you realize you're going to run through those funds pretty quickly. And if you have a spouse, that's even more of a concern because there's two of you who will run through the funds very quickly. And in some cases, there's nothing that can be done about that. And if you end up spending all of your money, it leads you to wonder how you're going to pay for your care. So that brings us to the issue of Medicaid. So our law firm does put on Medicaid seminars once a year where we explain more of the details of the Medicaid process. And I'm not meant to get into that today in too much detail, but I will just give you an overview of Medicaid. So when people hear the term Medicaid, they often confuse it with Medicare. So Medicare is a different program altogether, and everyone's eligible for that program at a certain age. Whereas Medicaid is going to pay for nursing home care or long-term care. And this is essentially a welfare program. So you have to qualify for it. And um, we know it's different because it ends in aid, so that's showing a need. 
Um, when applying for Medicaid, right now, the current rules require you to have no more than $2,000 in assets. Um, however, you can own a home, but that home has to be your primary residence, and there's an equity cap of about $878,000. So if you have a million dollar home, no mortgage, you will not qualify for Medicaid. If you have a million dollar home with a $200,000 mortgage attached, you may qualify for Medicaid if all other requirements are met. Um, in addition to those two requirements, you cannot have about more than about $2,000 in income monthly as well. And if you have more than that, you're expected to contribute to the cost of your care. Now, the last thing about Medicaid you should be aware of is that there is a look back period. And so what that means is you cannot um, find out this information, give all your assets away to your kids on Monday and apply for Medicaid on Friday. It's not gonna work. There's a five year look back period presently. And at one point it was three years. Now it's five and who knows when and if it will go up to a, a longer period. Um, so in other words, when you apply for Medicaid, they're gonna look back five years. They're gonna see your records, your statements to show that you have not given anything of gift or value within that period of time. So that means that you really have to plan ahead if your plan is to gift assets um, to your children or family members to get ahead of that rule. Um, but, you know, if all of the stars align and you are in a position where your assets would qualify for Medicaid, what we want to make sure is that your trust has what we call Medicaid triggers. So the Medicaid triggers make it much easier for your trustee to apply for Medicaid on your behalf and to move assets around um, as allowed by the rules. So getting back to our story, you heard about Bill and Mary. Now they're retired, they're enjoying life, and all of a sudden Bill suffers a stroke. And um, as a result of the stroke, he's having a lot of trouble. So he has some memory issues, some cognitive issues. Um, he cannot hear out of one ear. He's got some vision issues. And the right side of his body is also impacted. And he's right-handed, so he can't sign anything. So for all intents and purposes, he's now disabled and his disability is now preventing him from doing any planning because this is usually when it becomes real for people oh now my husband had a stroke so let's plan for Medicaid and in a lot of instances that's too late to be doing that kind of planning however for Bill and Mary it, they have a little different situation in that Mary is his spouse and there are some allowances um, with regard to Medicaid if you have a spouse who is living who does not need care. In that case, you can transfer a certain amount of assets to your spouse, but you need to make sure that the documents you have, your estate planning documents, allow for someone to do these things on your behalf and we call those Medicaid triggers. So they have the trust, and the trust thankfully has Medicaid triggers. And as a result, Mary has the legal authority to reposition their assets. So she can transfer their home to herself, she can transfer a certain amount of money all over to her side. Um, there is a limit, she can't transfer everything, um, but there's a cap there. But she can transfer a good amount, and what that does is get those assets out of Bill's name and make it easier for him to qualify for Medicaid. And unlike that look back period that applies to gifts to anyone else, when it's your spouse, we don't have that problem. So we don't have to worry about that five year transfer. So she's able to get things out of his name, apply for Medicaid on his behalf and get him qualified. Now defect number three is no protection for untrustworthy heirs. So I didn't really talk too much about John, but I will say that John is the black sheep of the family. So he never really cared for school. He dropped out of school, doesn't have a full-time job. He kind of works when he feels like it. And it's caused Bill and Mary a lot of concern. And for that reason, they want to protect any money that goes to him. They don't want to give him unfettered access to the money. And so they set up a creditor protection trust for him, or a special sub-trust for him, I should say. And Susan, meanwhile, is very trustworthy. She's a CPA, she's very good with money, she's always been responsible. So they sort of separate the two shares out to their kids. They're treating them equally as far as the distribution amount, but John's share is restricted and Susan gets her share outright and free of trust, meaning no restriction. They know that she'll do the right thing. 
And John's share, meanwhile, is going to be managed by Susan because she's going to be the successor trustee. So she'll be the gatekeeper, so to speak. When John makes a request for money, if it's a reasonable request, she's going to give it to him. He will get any income that flows off his share of the assets, but the principal is going to be at the discretion of the trustee. So that's uh, sort of similar to this creditor protection. I misspoke. That was another type of trust structure, sort of a spendthrift. But this creditor protection is somebody who has a demonstrated problem with money, or they have creditors out there after them. Bill and Mary didn't work for years and years to just have all their money pay their son's debts. So for that reason, they want to provide for him, but they want that money there just as needed. They don't want any money to go directly to him and risk all those creditors attaching liens because they will intercept those funds um, if they go into his name. So this is a structure that's created again for a third party to manage the money for him and to funnel out money as needed. But if he's requesting $300,000 to buy a fancy car, that's probably not going to fly with his sister. But if he needs money to supplement his rent or whatever other um, things may come up for him, she can give him money for those purposes. Now defect number five is no protection from divorce. So this is a pretty popular feature among our clients and it's because they're thinking about their children and they're thinking about the current divorce rate being quite high. <laughs> and sometimes their kids are not married. I mean, for me personally, I have divorce protection in my trust for my two kids who are seven and 10. You know, so they're no, in no danger of getting married, but we never know what's gonna happen. And so what this is, is a special sub-trust that gets created upon the death of the trust store. So Bill and Mary are gone, and it's gonna create this pot for John so that anything that he inherits, he can keep separate from his spouse. So he'll have his own trust in his name, and he'll open a bank account under that trust name, and he'll be able to put all the money he inherited into this pot. So in the event of a divorce, he can show, number one, this money was inherited, it's my separate asset. Number two, I have not commingled that money. It's always been my money. As opposed to John just getting um, a distribution from the trust and he puts it into a joint asset with his spouse. That's different. If he had done that, he would have made that into a marital asset and it would be difficult to untangle those funds in the event of divorce. So. Um, again, a lot of our clients do appreciate this feature. <clears throat> now, defect number six is no protection for disabled heirs. And uh, as I mentioned, about 10% of families do have a disabled or special needs family member they'd like to provide for. And traditionally, people in this situation were excluded as beneficiaries, not because they didn't want to include them, but because they were so worried that giving them money would disqualify them. Now we can set up a special needs trust for individuals in this situation. And it's going to be managed by a third party, so all the funds will go into this special trust for the benefit of this person. So they are not the owners of this um, money or assets that go into the subtrust, but they are the named beneficiaries. So the money in that subtrust does not need to be reported anywhere if they apply for benefits, if they reapply for benefits. We don't have to say anything about this money, but it's there to enhance their lives because maybe they're getting money that covers certain things, living expenses, but it's not enough for, for food, it's not enough for clothing or other things that they may need, toiletries, etc. So they can dip into this pot here um, to enhance their lives. So it's a nice feature for those who need it. Defect number seven is no incentives for heirs. So this is sort of a different structure altogether. Let's say that Bill and Mary knew that John was trying to turn his life around. So he had gotten a full-time job, he had gone back to school part-time, he stopped partying as much, and so they figured that he was on the right path and they wanted to encourage that behavior. What they could have done is set up a subtrust for John that requires him to meet certain conditions before he receives distributions from the trust. Now if he meets these conditions, then he'll get a distribution. And it could be anything. They want him to get a job, they want him to go to school, they want him to take random drug tests and test negative before he gets any distributions. We have some trusts like that. Um, one of our clients that I can think of um, set up an incentive trust for his son in which his son's distributions every year will match his W-2 form. 
In other words, the more money he earns, the more money he gets from the trust. Now, some of us cannot sustain that kind of um, distribution, but in this case, his son doesn't work at all. So he feels like this is going to push him to get a job. And if he doesn't get a job, he doesn't get any money from the trust, and whatever is remaining will then go to some other person. So, you know, you set it up how you like, but that worked for him. Defect number eight is no IRA stretch provision. So this is a technical um, idea, and I'm not a CPA, but I will try my best to explain what I'm talking about here. So whenever we have retirement accounts, annuities, 401ks, IRAs, pensions, it is our recommendation to simply name beneficiaries on those accounts. So even if you have a trust, we don't want to move those accounts into your trust. And the reason why is, for one thing, those companies will not even allow you to change the ownership to your trust. And that's because it's an individual retirement account, so it needs to be owned by an individual. Um, but some people say, well, if I can't move it into the trust, I'm going to name the trust as beneficiary. So when I die, all that money just goes to the beneficiaries of my trust. And it, in some cases, makes sense. But the thing about doing that is that you implicate some tax issues. And if you do that, you want to make sure that your trust accounts for being named as a beneficiary. And the reason why is your trust has to be what we call a look-through trust, or it has to have look-through provisions, and we call it um, a qualified retirement trust. So if you name your trust as the beneficiary of your retirement account, your tax-deferred account, and um, your trust does not have the special language that the retirement company wants to see, then they will require all the funds to be paid out of your retirement account within five years of your death. So what that does is it accelerates the payment of taxes. Um, and most of us want to take the minimum that we need to take, um, unless we need more. But you know, at 70 and a half, you start taking required minimum distribution. So you're taking it out slowly over time. If it all came out within five years, the tax is going to be hefty. Now, if you do have the special provisions in your trust, and your trust is named as the beneficiary of your retirement account, what you want to make sure is that, or actually what you're doing is saying that the beneficiaries of your trust are now the beneficiaries of your retirement account. So you want that company to accept them as the beneficiaries. If that information is in there, then they'll be able to stretch out their distributions based on their life expectancies. So it's um, a really nice thing, especially when you think of the fact that you may be naming your children as beneficiaries of your retirement account. They're much younger, they have longer life expectancies. So they get to stretch out and pay taxes little by little rather than getting hit with a hefty tax. So here's an example of that. Let's suppose Mary had an IRA worth $100,000. And if she named her trust as the beneficiary and the trust did not have those special look through provisions, then they would be taxed at about $18,000. So you know, not an enormous tax, but still 18%, it's, it's a lot, and they wouldn't get the full benefit of that $100,000 because the money would come out within five years. Now, if she did have stretch provisions, her kids are much younger. So the distributions, the measurable life is going to be the life of the oldest beneficiary, which is John. And based on that, potentially, they would be able to receive $1.1 million from this same account and that's due to compound interest um, being accumulated over time and taking out little by little. So it's a big difference. And so the main point I want to make here is if you have a tax deferred account, like a traditional IRA, annuity, uh, 401k, then it's recommended to stay away from naming the trust as beneficiary. You should just name your spouse as primary, then the kids, or you know whatever arrangement works for you. But if you name your trust, you really have to uh, make sure that your trust has the right provisions in it. Now, we include these provisions in our trust, but still we recommend naming um, human beneficiaries with life expectancies because it is a hassle for people to have to present the trust and all the information to the retirement companies and go through their um, process. Now defect number nine is vague or missing language. So a lot of trusts or estate planning documents in general 
have a lot of legal jargon. Um, we're asked almost daily why it has to say all the things that it says and can we just take this out and, and that. And no, a lot of it is very important and it's there for a reason. Um, but we know that your trust should have flexible language. And one reason we say that is because of that death tax issue. So prior to 2001, if you were an estate planning attorney setting up a trust for a married couple, you were saying when the first spouse dies, let's split the trust into two sub-trusts and let's preserve both spouses' estate tax exemptions. And that's because it was 650000 per person. So if we did that, we had $1.3 million to shelter against any estate tax. But now it's drastically changed. So you can see it's gone all over the place over the years. Um, and in 2010, interestingly, the estate tax was abolished. So um, the Congress had met and they decided, let's just get rid of the estate tax. So even if somebody dies um, with a lot of money, we're not going to collect any money. Now, funny enough, that was a year that the Yankees owner, George Steinbrenner, died. And um, he had billions of dollars, and they realized they had made a mistake. So they decided to re-implement the estate tax exemption. So that was a short-lived um, estate tax abolishment. And now we're at this high exemption. But what we see is a lot of people have really old trusts, and their trusts have the old structure. And that becomes an issue. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, as a married couple who have a joint trust, it says, typically, upon the death of the first spouse, we're going to split into an A trust and a B trust. The A trust here is a survivor's trust, which means it's for the benefit of the survivor. Oh, that turned upside down. That's interesting. Wow. <laughs> we're just keeping you on your toes. Yeah. Um, so the survivor's trust is for the benefit of the surviving spouse, and they have full control over all the assets within the trust. Um, and they get all of the income that flows off the family trust. So for example, let's say there are rental properties. So at that first death, the rental properties get retitled, one half into a family trust, one half into a survivor's trust. They're earning income, so the survivor gets all that income, but the survivor can only use the principal for what we call, there's an acronym there, their health, their education, maintenance, and support. So very broad terms. But the point is that the surviving spouse can no longer have full control over the, over the family trust. That trust is irrevocable. So they cannot change their minds about anything there. Um, and so that does impact some of our clients because I've seen it several times where the first spouse dies <clears throat> and the survivor wants to make changes because maybe they have multiple children, but only one child has retired early to care for mom, cared for dad before he died, um, is really the one doing everything. And so mom now feels it's right to leave the child the house or you know, wants to make some changes. But their mom is limited. She can only change what the survivor's trust says. She cannot redirect the funds in the family trust. So a lot of people find this structure really um, not workable for them nowadays. Now, it was totally workable when it was saving us taxes, but now that it's 11.4 million per person, we really don't need to preserve both exemptions. And so what we're doing nowadays is we set up a joint trust for married couples that upon the death of the first spouse all funnels into a survivor's trust. And that makes it easy for the survivor to control the entire estate. They don't have to worry about um, creating the two sub-trusts. Because the other thing about the family trust that I want to point out is that family trust is, because it's irrevocable, it's its own separate tax entity. So it has to get a tax ID number and it does a separate tax filing every year. And so that can be um, problematic because it's a hassle and it's another expense um, that is due. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, the, uh, the house that I own, under the revocable living trust, mm -hmm. the attorney apparently also indicated it's under my name, family trust. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that I sh you should take it out of the, my property that I'm living in out of the family trust now? Or it's hard for me to say yeah. exactly without looking at the documents because I don't know how it came, if that was from um, a married trust or is that an inherited asset? I see. Yeah. So if any, any one of us want to meet with you, you know, later. Yes. Uh, is that something we can set up? Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Okay.
Yeah, and Brandon's got my cards, uh, my business cards, and he'll pass those out. But um, I am happy to meet with any of you to discuss your situations. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention everything would go into the Survivors Trust nowadays, and that way there's full control, there's no need to do a separate tax filing. If the survivor for that one child who's doing everything for her, she can. And then upon death, it still goes out to the two kids, um, and you know we don't have to worry about any of the restrictions. But we also build in the option for the surviving spouse to still split the trust into two separate subtrusts if the estate tax exemption is gonna impact your estate because we don't know what the future holds. So that's the flexibility we now include. <clears throat> okay, so the other area we see where there is sometimes vague or missing language is when it comes to how the assets are used during the disability of a spouse. So most of the time we think of each spouse is owning 50% of the estate, 50% of the assets. And so when one spouse becomes disabled, requires care, the question becomes, do we want to use only 50% of the assets to pay for care and then look into other avenues, or do we want to use the other spouse's assets as well? the spouse who is still doing well. And that becomes a concern sometimes in second marriage situations where the children of the spouse who does not need care are questioning why mom is using her money to pay for her husband's care. And is the money gonna be there for her own care if necessary? And there's no right or wrong answer, but we know that sometimes trusts don't address this issue. And so it's really um, nebulous to us and we don't know how to deal with the situation. Now we also see that there is sometimes ambiguity about the definition of what is an heir. Um, for us, the general definition of an heir is a blood descendant or a legally adopted person, legally adopted child, you know, or adopted under the age of 18, I should say. Um, but sometimes people have Hanai family members. We often have clients who list all their children for us and never um, distinguish between those they birth and those that um, are Hanai family members because for them there's no difference between the two. But we do need to know that because those Hanai family members, if they're not, there's no legal relationship, they are not included in the definition of heirs. So if we want them to be a part of our estate, we have to name them specifically and we have to say that we're recognizing them as one of our children and their descendants should be considered our descendants. Um, we also have clients who sometimes would like to exclude legal adoption. Maybe that's because their child has adopted their stepchildren and those stepchildren have a whole nother family who's going to provide for them. So they don't want to exclude them because they don't like them, um, but because they know that they're already provided for elsewhere. And so if that's your situation, you should ensure that your trust has the right definition when it comes to heirs. And then we also see that despite our best efforts to get everything organized just so, there are sometimes conflicts that arise between the trustee and the beneficiaries. And um, what we want to make sure is that they don't have to go to court. We don't want that to be their first step because that's going to be expensive and it's also going to ramp up all those emotions. It's going to ruin relationships. So we would like to see language in there that allows for mediation or arbitration or some other um, lesser type of intervention. And then we also include a no contest clause. So this is something that is standard in all of our wills and trusts. And what it says is if you are named as a beneficiary and you decide to contest what you're to receive because you feel you should receive more than that, then we're gonna treat you as if you predeceased the trust door. So we're just gonna skip over you and go to the next person. <laughs> and it's meant to be a deterrent because anyone who decides to take that action is gonna hire an attorney, likely, and that attorney is gonna request to see the trust, look at that provision and say, um, you should think twice about this because you will lose your inheritance. Now our last defect is no built-in flexibility and we think flexibility is the key to a well-drafted trust and you really should have provisions that adjust to changing circumstances. Um, and so I talked about some of those um, things as far as that tax issue that nowadays we don't want the trust to split automatically. If you're a married couple we would like it all to go into the survivor's trust and you know we need to be able to adjust to that situation. One way we do that is we include language with regard to a special co-trustee. 
So the special co-trustee is also known as a trust protector. This is a person who can be brought in if there's an issue that arises in the trust. So if there's a conflict between the trustees and the beneficiaries, we want someone to be able to weigh in on that. It also could be, um, it could be any number of people. I've had situations where clients are um, ready to sell, or my client's children are ready to sell their parents' home, and then there becomes an issue with the, the boundaries of their property. And that's because their parents had owned the house for 70 years and lived next door to the same family for all those years, and they informally agreed that it was okay for them to kind of broach on each other's land and it worked out for them but now that they're selling they need to take that land back and there is some disagreement about that so they may have to hire a land surveyor um, bring in a realtor real estate attorney somebody to help so that person could also be a co-trustee we just want to give them the papers we're magazines every yeah and then we're, we're involved in the community as well um, so a few of the things that we want to go over discussion, the, uh, the growing importance for Hawaii seniors or families to plan ahead for long-term care. Uh, how will I know if it's the right time to move into an assisted living community? What specialized programs and services do the plaza offer uh, to residents now as their needs change? Obviously, Hawaii is the, has one of the fastest growing uh, 65 and over populations in the country. We are the state that lives the longest. Um, so, you know, those two things, people migrating to our, our community and the fact that everybody here lives longer means that we have a growing need, obviously, right? Um, Hawaii's aging population is increasing, but the group which, uh, of caregivers is shrinking in proportion. Obviously, a lot more people are leaving. They're going to the mainland, right? They're going to other countries and so on. So the availability for caregivers that combined with uh, seven in 10 people who reach the age of 65 will need long-term care in their lifetime. Uh, and this was something that, that uh, we heard in the trust discussion too. Um, the, the, the number of people right now, I think she was saying it's about a 40-60 split that will need long-term care or skilled nursing in their lifetime. And that's growing. That number is growing because people are living longer <laughs> so we're seeing more health issues uh, over time as the bodies, the bodies give out. Um, the, the state has only half as many nursing home beds per capita as the national average. I don't know if that scares you guys, but it scares me a little bit that, that there's just not that much availability uh, for you know, people to take care of us. So obviously the need for what we do is growing. We have six locations now um, and projecting possibly uh, a couple more in the future. Local businessmen struggle to find suitable place for his aging parents. So many of you don't know the history behind our company. I'm not going to make this a long drawn out thing. Uh, our partners um, that own the company, they, they were looking for uh, adequate uh, places for their folks at one point in California. And here in California, there was a vast number of options. Here, unless you were going to spend a bunch of money to buy into a community, there really wasn't the opportunity to have a, a really nice standard of living uh, at this level. A really classy place, hi Maka Maka, right? Um, so this, this was started because there were, we needed options in the uh, month to month, like no lease agreement that's tying you down for the rest of your life for many years. And no major buy-in with a, a huge amount of capital that was gonna require that money be tied up for a number of years or just simply displaced completely from your family and not giving you the, the ability to, if somebody's in, in financial peril, to rescue them or, or loan somebody for a startup business, anything like that, or gifting even. That money is just tied up. Uh, so that's why we were started. Uh, faced with limited availability, uh, determination was foundation of Plaza Assisted Living. Obviously, um, all of our locations, the newest, uh, at Kaneohe, everybody's probably seen commercials for that going on right now, yeah? I hope so, or we're not doing a good job getting our commercials out there. <laughs> not everybody watches TV anymore though, so That's right. a lot of people are, uh, you know, just, just uh, prime video or something. Um, so 2004 is our first location, Punch Bowl location. Everybody's probably heard of that one up by the freeway. Um, 2010, Mililani, Moana Lua. Uh, Pearl City in 2014 and uh, Waikiki in 2015. Now, of course, 
Kani Yohei, if you have not been over to our new Kani Yohei location, by the way, please give them a call and set up a tour there. It's a beautiful location. Brand new building. Everybody loves a brand new building, right? <laughs> Go check it out. The mo our model of care is kind of three point. Uh, it very heavily involves family, the plaza, and the healthcare providers all coordinating together for our residents' well-being. Now, most of our residents in, in most of our buildings, we're going to be like 70, 80 percent independent living. So most people don't require a lot from us. They just enjoy the lifestyle. And younger and younger, we're seeing people move into our communities to just enjoy the fact that we provide all the meals, we do all the housekeeping, transportation, everything, and they just go out and play. <laughs> Very simple. Or they travel and spend time with family. Yeah. Um, independent living. So programs and services that we provide, independent living encourages residents to continue their independent lifestyle, experience a plaza, superb uh, hospitality. Uh, independent living program targets um, single people, uh, maybe living alone, caregiver burnout, uh, no longer driving or, or shouldn't be, <laughs> um, poor nutrition, lonely, becoming physically inactive, socially isolated, um, missed medical appointments, depressed. Obviously, um, what we really, what, for independent living, people, a lot of people that come and tour my community have the misconception that this is a nursing home. They think that this is where you go to die, you know? Mm -hmm. We have the opposite opinion. This is where you go to live. Life is for the living, right? This is where you go to have fun, to enjoy your life, and we take over. You go on a cruise, why do you go on a cruise? It's to have fun, right? You don't want to cook, you don't want to clean, you don't want to plan the, the, the social interaction. You just want to do whatever you want to do and lay, on, lay out by the pool whenever you want to, right? That's exactly the point here. Um, the people that move in here that even have trepidation, within a month or two, the, this is the best thing we've ever done. We're having a lot of fun. Um, uh, assisted living is another level of care that we provide here. We have one floor dedicated to, to assisted living in all of our communities. We're licensed as assisted living throughout the entire community, so you can always get a little assistance, even in independent living, if you have to go for a surgery or something, you don't have to relocate and it allows for a smoother transition uh, and we can wait for that availability in assisted living. You don't have to move out if we don't have availability. So it's a great situation. But assisted living is really for somebody, medication management can be even independent living by the way. But um, fall risk needs assistance with one to three of activities of daily living. Um, things like you know showering, getting dressed, things like that. Grooming issues. Um, or people that have more forgetfulness, have um, mobility issues, concerns for safety, or need transportation. Just people whose needs on a daily basis include our service. Uh, our memory care. So our halia, uh, which means cherished memories, is a globally recognized program. We have people coming from all over the world to tour our community and see how we do our memory care here. Uh, which includes dementia, uh, all forms of dementia, maybe uh, cognitive cognitive disorders caused by trauma, things like that. Uh, but that's for people with memory loss, confusion, uh, incapable of managing medications. They're forgetting all the time. They don't know if they took it. They take it twice, three times. Um, repeat themselves, neglects personal care. Wandering risk, like could end up in Kahala and not know how they got there, right? Um, help with personal hygiene, forgetfulness, um, frequent hospital or doctor visits, concerns for safety, needs transportation. Everybody knows somebody that's affected by dementia, right? This is something that's, that's kind of a growing awareness and certainly a growing need. And it's something we are very good at. It's something we're very proud of, our program here. Um, Halia, I'm gonna skip that part. Uh, extended care. Uh, extended care service is something we're offering at our Kaneohe location, and this is for people that are not necessarily ambulatory, who need that extra help. A little more nursing care. Not quite skilled nursing, but certainly more uh, a little higher level than we can handle in most of our other locations. Um, increased ratio of team members allows Plaza to provide care to non-ambulatory, uh, including positioning, turning, monitoring. Uh, setting will feature a common dining and activities facility, laundry service, 24-hour staff, personal care, health and support. Extended care services include short-term or long-term options, nurses available 24 hours a day, comprehensive therapy services, excellent on-site amenities. I'll say this, all of our communities, independent, assisted memory care, 
have 24-7 nursing on staff always available to you. So even if you're independent living and you're laying in bed, you get a chest pain, you go, oh, it's the big one. Um, you can call for a nurse and they will come and they'll do vitals and check you out and make sure you're okay. They can triage and call 911 only if necessary to have you transport to a hospital. Um, respite, short-term stay, uh, rehabilitation, and hospice care. These are all things that are available with our communities as well. Respite stay, coming out of the hospital, you need help for a month while you're getting better. Right? Leaving town, mom and dad are going to be al alone at home. You can't leave them home at, uh, alone. That's where we come in. Two weeks or more for a respite stay. Okay? Um, convenient month to month. As I said, no buy-in, no lease. Uh, a lot of apartment styles, three meals a day served restaurant style. You sit down, we take your order, we serve you. That's every day. You never cook again. <laughs> Sign up now? Yeah? Okay. Uh, monthly wellness program, which includes access to our nursing staff uh, and weekly housekeeping with linen service. That means we put fresh towels, we change the sheets on your bed. Cruise, right? Hotel. Uh, daily activities and exercise programs. That means it lectures. That means um, you know, visits from Kapuna Wiki, that means a, a lot of different activities. Music, oil painting, you name it, we've got it. Uh, scheduled transportation to and from doctor's appointments, basic utilities are included. Uh, community features, the coffee bistro is up front. You can get your cappuccino, espresso, vanilla coffee, mocha, mochaccino. Um, recreation rooms, living rooms, fitness room, hair salon, outdoor seating areas. Uh, you've seen the, the Grand Lanai out here, our, our Hoka Terrace. Computer stations, library, and game rooms. So everything is here. Uh, personal care services, medication management, incontinence care, bathing, grooming, dressing, hygiene, and escorts to uh, appointments, shopping, things like that are available as well. Uh, these are all uh, things that we charge additionally for. Um, uh, of course, many different floor plans. Uh, after we're done here, if anybody wants a tour, I can take everybody as a group and give them a tour through the community and I can show you an apartment, see what, what our views are like, you know, how quiet the apartments are even though we're like right next to a, the, the parade in traffic today, you know. Um, but we do have studios, one bedrooms, and in our, um, in our, on our service levels, assisted living and memory care, we also have what we call companion suites. Um, and in most, in a lot of communities, it's just a wall that divides. In our community, it's separate bedrooms. You have your own door, TV, chair, couch, whatever, inside your room, and you share a restroom and, and a kitchenette. And I'm sorry for people that I'm blocking the room. So. Um, the Plaza Guarantee. The Plaza Guarantee uh, basically says for the first two months that you're here, mm -hmm. our, our move in cost to move into a community here is $3,500. That's it, no buy in. Okay? We call that a community fee. For the first two months that you're here, that can be refunded to you and you can move out for any reason. That means we want you to be happy here. We want your family member to be happy here. Anybody that moves in here, we want to feel very comfortable with their decision. And we feel that the first two months is a very good uh, trial period so that you don't have to risk the investment. You just pay for the time you've been here and we give you back that, that deposit, that $3,500, a community fee and God bless, enjoy. Um, benefits of living at, at the Plaza Assisted Living, customized personal care plan for each resident. Uh, living space is designed for safety, mobility, comfort, Plaza, uh, County Ohe has extended care, as we said, and we do allow transfers between our communities. Um, access to our daily wellness and recreation activities, housekeeping, laundry, meal preparation, transportation, uh, social and recreational opportunities, it's a month-to-month -month rental. That means you can give us 30 days notice at any time. Let us know that you want to move to the mainland to go move closer to a great-grandchild or something. Uh, and we're pet, pet friendly. You can have a dog or a cat. Maybe a bird if we like the bird. <laughs> um, so again, I thank you guys all for coming. Thank you for indulging me in my presentation as well. Uh, because we're hosting, we get we get the right to, yep. to, to bugger you a little bit with who we are and, and educate you a little bit. Uh, we thank Kapuna Wiki for coming in and, of course, bringing in the services that they continue to bring to the community. And anybody that wants to take a tour following the wrap-up here, um, I'll be ready to give you guys a quick tour of the community, including uh, you know one of the residential floors, so you can see what it looks like and the apartment. Okay.
Thank you, ladies. You guys.